explaining. In case you're joining us for the first time, this is the CDSE Central Deposition and Settlement Corporation, and we do webinar, a security lending and borrowing webinar series on a monthly basis. And in case you need to find previous recordings, you can just go to our YouTube page at CDSC Kenya. For those who are also interested in learning about securities lending and borrowing, we have the content on our website at www.cdscenya.com. So my name is Steven Atema. I work with CDSC and I shall be the host for the day. Uh, before we go, to, go into the, the nitty gritties of our, of our webinar discussion, I'd just like to introduce our panelists for the day so that we can get you can get to understand who you're interacting with before we get the discussions going. So our first uh, panelist, uh, for those who, who are joining us for the first time, I might not have, have seen him or heard of him before, but uh, Mr. George Bodo is the CEO of uh, Call Street Research and Analytics. He's, the, he's a career investment uh, analyst with 10 years, over 10 years experience in the capital markets, and he has been focusing on the sell side equity research. He'll tell us more about what sell side equity research means and uh, what he's, he's been doing at Call Street. He, he, his areas of coverage have included banking, telecommunications, aviation, manufacturing, and energy sectors. Uh, he's a certified investment and financial analyst, as well as a thought leader and a regular columnist. So George, for those who are not sure who you are, you can just wait for the, to the team before I proceed to the next one. George, thank you. Uh, the next panelist, uh, he is called Linus Kangara. Linus is the head of brokerage at KCB Capital and has over 10 years experience in investment brokerage and, committee, and commodities trading. He is a bachelor of he is a bachelor of has a bachelor of science in actuarial science from Jomo Kenyatta University, as well as an MBA in finance from the University of Nairobi. He is also a certified public accountant and a member of ISIFA. Our third panelist for the day is Ms. Marion Kioi. She is the general manager, client, and intermediary services at CDSC, and here she is charged with the safe custody of securities management, uh, securities management of daily electronic clearing, delivery, and settlement. She has over 16 years experience in the operations at CDSC and has a wealth of experience in the capital markets. She's also a secretary of the CDSC Business Conduct Committee and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Nairobi. She is currently pursuing her Master's of Science degree in finance at the University of Nairobi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Marion, uh, Linus, and George, you can just wave to the team before we, we get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I, I will thank you for, for continuing to join and uh, add your, your indulgence in this session. We shall be having uh, a discussion between the panelists and, and myself, and then a presentation by Marion, which will, be the, which will set the, the, the ball rolling for the discussions. And then after that, we shall also in, invite questions and answers from you, the audience. So we add your keen attendance for the webinar and also in case you have any other pertinent issues about securities lending and borrowing, we shall be here to respond. Uh, for those who might not be able to share their questions in a live session, we also have the chat section. So you can also put your, your questions or remarks in that section and uh, our team shall be able to assist. So I'm sure most of us have heard about uh, short selling uh, of stocks and probably People who are in, uh, movie fanatics have uh, have seen several movies that uh, front these investment strategies, like uh, The Big Shot or the Margin Call or Wall Street. So the people who have heard about that probably did not think that such a product or such a, an investment such strategy would be possible in our market. So we are here to see if indeed what we see in the movies is what happens in real life and how that can be applied in the Kenyan capital markets, and if indeed. It is working, and uh, that will be that will be the discussion for the day, as well as any other uh, investment strategies that you can use with uh, securities lending and borrowing. But just to get things started, uh, everybody is talking about this uh, this new financial crisis that we we are, we are facing as, as as a country or as a as a global capital market. Um, uh, George, do you have any thoughts about uh, this company called Evergrande? And um, what are your thoughts with, with regard to what has happened in that space? Is it just an unfortunate situation or is it likely a manifestation of what is uh, 
uh, a moral hazard of big companies not uh, being uh, too big to fail. You're on mute. Yeah, so uh, still good morning and good morning to the participants. Um, Evergrande for me, it's, um, it's not really a moral hazard. It's uh, what's wrong with the real estate markets, um, especially um, the impact of the pandemic on real estate market. It's been quite significant. Um, I mean, even locally here, you could see, I mean, the, the, the need, uh, the move companies and workers and entrepreneurs to, to go back and work from their homes meant that office space requirements uh, completely uh, went down and, and, and you could see that uh, uh, the commercial space there has been a glut and I think that uh, you I did some research a couple of, of, of weeks back and this a significant glut in the commercial space market. So if you extend that to globally, um, it's exactly what is playing out in, in the Evergrande um, situation because Evergrande is a real estate developer uh, focusing on, uh, on, the, on the rental space. And the second thing also is, um, and by the way, it's not just Evergrande. I, I was just reading on the Financial Times article in the morning today, and uh, there are about four other real estate developers in China that are facing financial difficulties. Some of them are likely to miss their bond, um, bond coupon payments. I think I was doing about four of them. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dicey situation for the Chinese. And uh, I also speak to the fact that the funding model needs to change because you could realize that the Evergrande and, and, and their likes of Evergrande, they funded their expansion through debt. And now they're in big problems. They can meet the debt obligations here. And also the last thing also is a problem with central plan. Sorry? It's also a manifestation of problems around central planning, oh, uh, which okay. is a, it's a benchmark of Chinese economy. All right. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But uh, Lina, being in the financial se sector, uh, as, a, as, a, as an advisor to your clients or people who would be uh, potentially exposed to such situations such as the Evergrande, how, how can an investor uh, get out of such dicey situations? And can they even really, uh, after, after a company like that defaults uh, in their bond? Or, because when you, when you look at the Evergrande situation, it, it looks like uh, people could have seen it coming, yet the, uh, the investors and banks kept pumping money into the institution. Linus? Can you hear me? Yes, everybody seems to be speaking on mute. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I think, as uh, George has said, the Evergrande story is more of a moral hazard, but I think it's more on a fundamental basis a question of, uh, uh, you know, the model, the, 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 debt, the debt model that some of these real estate uh, companies uh, undertake to fund uh, their projects. If you look at the Evergrande uh, situation, their debt to cash ratio was, was uns unsustainable. And uh, uh, like in, in all cases, before such a disaster or a financial disaster of this magnitude, there are always red flags. Like in the case of Evergrande, you'll find that uh, uh, they, they, they were taking in more debt uh, to, in, in, in this case, short-term debt to fund uh, you know, real estate projects, uh, real estate projects uh, by, by their very nature are, are very long term. So uh, given the pandemic uh, that, that, that happened uh, uh, sometime in the beginning early, early last year, this could have only worsened or ex exacerbated their, their economic uh, conditions. And, mm -hmm. and this is, as, as, as George has said, is more of a global phenomenon. We are more likely to see it uh, uh, clo closer home, you know, on the shores of uh, of, of Africa and, 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 and even, uh, you know, in our own economy, where real estate will, will continue to struggle and possibly not be able to meet some of their obligations. Uh, besides this, I think also Evergrande diverted uh, from their core business and possibly invested uh, in, in other non-core business uh, 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 businesses like uh, media and internet companies and the like. I think at some point they went into the business of venturing into electric vehicles. 
mm. and therefore uh, you know channeling some of the funds to other than uh, real estate uh, what you asked about uh, investors being able to leave it, it's a dicey situation like in the case of evergrande we've seen uh, you know trading has been sus suspended mm. in some of the in some of the the market so it becomes difficult for an investor to be able to be able to leave uh, it's it's more or less uh, uh, you know like the old adage goes you know until it stops uh, raining that you realize uh, uh, who was more or less swimming uh, naked <laughs> okay I think, thank you, Lailas. And you, you brought an interesting uh, thought to my mind. And I think before you even go to Marion to, to see if uh, such a company would have been a, a candidate for, for short selling or SLB, what, what, what are we likely to see as contagion effects of such a company going under? And are we likely to also experience the same here? Or is this something that will happen in China and probably a bit of US and uh, we, we, we wait for the next crisis? George. Yes, I mean, um, uh, Evergrande had issued uh, uh, dollar bonds and uh, some of the offshore investors, uh, what included the dollar bonds included um, uh, money market funds in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so the contagion is likely, we are just likely to start seeing, we, well, we've not started unearthing who is behind, who are the investors in the dollar bonds, but I, I bet you, um, we had uh, huge commercial banks and uh, money market fund exposures. This is money market funds. This is very tricky because and gets very serious because um, remember that um, one of the biggest uh, triggers of the global financial crisis was the inability of money market funds to redeem. And so if depending on the, the extent of the nature of exposure and these dollar bonds issued by Evergrande, then you're likely to see money market funds starting to have liquidity problems. And that's that's not a good thing. Yeah, so that, that's where we're likely to the contagion. And also including banks who now have to take a, lot, a, a haircut on their exposure. So that's likely to be the contagion. So we're likely to see it spread in the financial markets across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, George. Uh, and Marion, just before even we get into your discussion, with, with products or companies such as uh, as Evergrande and other companies that might be going through financial troubles, they they more or less present an opportunity for somebody or an investor to short sell. Uh, but one then would would wonder: uh, is there is there a limit to how long you could short sell, or or are we something? Is a company uh, as an investor would you would you then be betting against a company uh, that is going under, or are you likely then? to be short selling a company to no end and the investor who lent the shares what what is the i'm trying what i'm trying to get at is is there like a, a moral a moral situation where somebody argues as I'm, as an investor i'm looking at a company going up but you are betting against a company going under so how how does how does uh, short selling uh, balance those those different schools of thoughts where one is arguing an investor is looking at companies going up and uh, get, maybe benefiting from the uh, price appreciation but then there is another participant who is saying uh, i'm making money from companies from the stock going under are those two uh, able to coexist um, yes Steve. i think they are able to coexist in in terms of when uh, someone decides to short sell, it's not necessarily because the company is going under. It's the fact that uh, you analyze the company and you realize that the shares are overpriced. Mm. So that's when you see there is an opportunity because the uh, share price is likely to go down in the future because that particular security is overpriced. So now when you short sell that stock, of course, your intention is to buy back the stock once the share price has gone down. So uh, once the market has actually corrected and the price has gone down so that you can be able to buy back and then you'll earn something from it. Mm. It's a, more or less like an opposite strategy from the normal trading because in normal trading, you analyze the stock and you see it's underpriced. So you buy and wait for the price to go up then you'll uh, sell at a later date when the price has gone up. So it's an opposite strategy to use like 
uh, in different uh, times of the market and uh, different times of the lifetime of that stock. But when it comes to a company that is going under, and uh, it's common knowledge that now this company is going under, you will find that in most such cases, uh, that stock will either be suspended or uh, even trading might be halted for that particular stock. So it would be possible for someone to do short sale when uh, before, before the stock is suspended or it's halted from trading, but then they have to be aware that uh, they will need to return those stocks at some point and they sh should be able to buy them back. Yes, okay. back to so you, Steve. Yes, so it works for, 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 for both parties. It's not necessarily that one has, has a malicious intention with regard to the performance of a stock and uh, whoever is lending is also likely going to be benefiting uh, from uh, the proceeds of, uh, of, of that investment. And I think maybe you shall you shall touch touch on that as we, as we as we guide us through the short selling of stocks using securities lending borrowing. But just before that, one final thought, uh, George. We seem to we seem to be having a disassociation between the financial markets and the capital markets in the sense that people uh, the, the sorry not the financial markets the economy and the capital markets because you find that in some in some jurisdictions the capital markets seems to be very well performing but the economy is stagnating or even at a, at a deceleration. So how does that work? And does Kenya have such a situation where the, the economy uh, is, uh, quote unquote, um, not correlated to the, the performance of the capital markets like, like we saw last year with the COVID and how the US stock market uh, had a bull run? Uh, yes, see, that's a very important question. Um, um, it, it be, the behavior of the capital markets and the economy, um, it, 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 it's, it's different in, 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 um, in different economies. And you need to do um, empirical analysis to establish the direction. Um, in Kenya, the available empirical analysis shows that um, it's a unidirectional uh, association. Uh, that of towards economy and, uh, and and the stock market. So what it means is that the economy affects the stock market, but the stock market doesn't affect the economy. It's it's probably bidirectional in the United States, such a way that um, uh, both both affect each other. But for Kenya, it's one direction. So, um, but of course, over the last um, let me say over the last thirteen years, uh, maybe ten years. Um, the, there's been a the dislocation has been largely driven by uh, central banks printing money um, and, and the Fed, of course, um, and this has propped up asset prices uh, by a significant margin, uh, such that this 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 it has, it has entrenched that dislocation. You can't see what's going on. I mean, today uh, the, the interest rate in the United States is zero. I mean, basically, money is cheap. And this, all this money ends up into the, into the capital markets, and, and and you see, you can also see the asset prices. So sometimes it's um, it's true, yes, the start this this location, and thanks if you add that to central bank printing money, now it, it widens that dislocation. So I agree with you on that, but it's it's just difficult. But I mean, from my my own reading, I mean, we we you know the books used to say that. Uh, the, the stock market is a voting machine where people people make choices on the economy, and uh, and some of those choices sometimes are based on emotions. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's all up in the air, Steve. Okay, thanks, thanks, George. And before we start talking about economics and forget why we're here, I'll go back to Marion, who is the the main the main person of the of the moment. And you can just tell, uh, we can just start by you telling us what short selling is and uh, if it's different from securities lending and borrowing, or if short selling is securities lending and borrowing. Maybe I'm sure that the audience might be a bit uh, keen or curious to understand what is short selling. How different is it from SLB, and are they the same, or uh, what what exactly is securities lending and borrowing with regard to short selling of stocks? 
So Marion, maybe you can just take away the, the, the session, do the, uh, with your presentation and uh, the rest of the panelists, I, I would urge you to just put off your mic so that we can fully concentrate on the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, just confirm that I'm audible. I'm not sure if my internet is stable. Please confirm. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you, Steve. Now, um, let's dive into the short selling of stocks through securities lending and borrowing. And as you've said, uh, the two are different, but support each other. So as we go into the presentation, we'll be able to see clearly how that is the case. So I want to start uh, with uh, like painting a picture of uh, where the world is in terms of uh, securities lending uh, revenues. Um, if you look at this slide, you will see that uh, in the first half of this year, the securities lending revenue was at 4.5 billion across uh, the world. And uh, if you look at the graph, you can see that uh, most of the revenue is generated from equities. There's a bit from uh, corporate bonds and government debt, but uh, most of it is uh, dominated by equities. And uh, why I'm bringing this slide is because I want us to like open up our minds to what this product really can uh, achieve for us as a market in Kenya. If these uh, revenues can be achieved globally, then even if we envision a small percentage of that because our market is smaller, it's still some good revenues for our market. Now, in terms of what is short selling, now short selling is really a trading strategy where the investor can make money from a stock by correctly anticipating a decline in the share price of that particular stock. As I had said earlier, the short seller would analyze a particular stock and uh, see whether the, that stock is overpriced or underpriced. Now, if the stock is overpriced, they can make that decision now to do a short sale. Now, a short sale basically means a sale of a security which the person who is selling does not own at that time of the sale. So the short seller, for example, decides they want to short sell uh, some shares of ABC company. Because they don't have these shares and uh, they can't sell what they don't have, that's where now the borrowing comes in because they have to borrow the shares for them to be able to do that short sale. So they sell the stocks at, uh, for example, 40 shillings per share. And then they wait for the market to correct itself and the price of that stock to fall. Then they buy back the shares at a, at a lower price, at probably 32 shillings per share. Now, when they buy at 32 shillings per share, remember, they had uh, borrowed 100 shares, and now they still buy back 100 shares. So if it's at 32 shillings, that means 3,200 shillings, whereas they had gained 4,000 when they uh, sold the stock. So that means the short seller has made a profit of the eight uh, shillings per share. Now, when they buy back the shares, they return them to the uh, person they had borrowed from. Now, when it comes to uh, how short selling works under SLB, in the previous slide, if the short seller did not have uh, anywhere where they could uh, borrow securities from, it would mean that they would have to buy back the securities immediately to cover that short position. But with SLB, SLB now allows them time because they can borrow the shares from the lender and they can take as much time as uh, necessary to wait for the price of the shares to go down. So it's the same way the borrower, uh, the lender, 
decides they want to lend securities, they give an instruction to their agent, the agent captures the lending on screen, such that on the other side, the borrower is able to see that actually these uh, shares are available to someone who's lending, so that when they want to short sell, they are sure that they are able to acquire the securities, because uh, naked short selling is not allowed in our market. You have to first establish where you will get the securities before you do a short sale. So with securities lending and borrowing, it's easy for the short seller to be able to see that uh, the securities are available in the lending pool so that they are able to then borrow those securities and uh, cover their short position in time for settlement. And uh, that means that the securities lending now offers them ample time to be able to uh, provide uh, those securities and to buy them back when the price is uh, appreciably low. Yes, um, so a disclaimer here is that uh, short selling is a trading strategy that uh, needs an expert trader because it's not like uh, gambling. Let me just short sell these shares and see whether they are going to, uh, the price is going to drop. No, it's, uh, it's a very important strategy and uh, you need expert advice when you want to do a short sale because, you, as I said, you need to be able to analyze the market and establish where the price of that particular security is going to go. Now, um, now in terms of what is securities lending and borrowing, it is basically a temporary transfer of shares from a lender to a borrower. In the case we've uh, given before, the short seller is the borrower. They are the ones who need the, their securities to cover short-term obligations. So a lender is anyone who holds shares in their securities account. They, they don't intend to sell them in the near future. Maybe they want to hold them in the medium or long-term. So they can lend those shares temporarily to a borrower so that the borrower can meet that short-term obligation. Now, the key features of securities lending and borrowing is that uh, the duration can be between one day and 365 days. So that means the borrower can borrow shares for one day or they can borrow for any time between one and 365 days. So in terms of the number of shares, one can be able to borrow either a minimum of 100, and there's no maximum. Anything above 100 uh, can be lent or borrowed. Of course, the lender can only lend to up to the maximum of what they have in their account. Then lenders always retain the right to recall the lent securities, meaning that uh, in case at a future date, they need those securities back to either sell them or to uh, participate in a rights issue or anything like that, they can still be able to recall security and the duration. Now, as to safeguarding the interests of the lender, because a lender will not lend shares unless they're sure that they are going to get their shares back. So we have to safeguard those interests and ensure that the lender will get back their shares at the end of the lending duration. So that is why 100% of the value of collateral is necessary for, before a borrower is able to borrow. So the borrower will provide 100% collateral and over and above that, they'll provide an initial margin of 10%. Now, the initial margin of 10% is to cover the price movements. As we have said, a, a, a borrower can borrow and sell shares today. Then instead of the price going down, the price starts appreciating. So the lender's shares has, have to still be protected. So the 10% will cover the price uh, movements. And additional collateral would be uh, requested if the price continues going up. Then, um, so in that two way, collecting that collateral, CDSC guarantees that the, tra the transactions ensure is that risk management shares in place to ensure that the lender will always get back their securities and also that 
the borrower will get back their lateral. In, uh, in this case, uh, the retirement benefits authority has already an no pension schemes to participate in SLB. Then uh, the securities that one can lend or borrow, and uh, so the same ones that uh, you'd be able to short sell after you have uh, borrowed are the securities that are part of the NSC 20 share index. Then now uh, let's look at an example how you can generate revenue from a short sale. Then now uh, we look at an example where an investor borrows 1 million shares trading at 50 bob at the NSC for a period of 90 days. So what is the cost of borrowing for that particular uh, transaction? Of course, it's the 1 million times 50 shares, which is the value of the shares. Then there's the 8% because the lender has said they paid 88%. And of course, the 8% is annual. So we, we change it to cover the 80 days. And then there's the commissions that the borrower needs to pay, which is the 0.55% of the 50 million over that period of 90 days. So the total borrowing cost is 1 million and uh, 54,109. Now, uh, if the price of that same stock falls by four shillings to 46 shillings, it means that what the borrower or the short seller needs is 46 million to buy back the shares. Remember, they sold the shares at 50 shillings and got 50 million shillings. So now they only need 46 million to buy back the same number of shares because the price has dropped. So the gross profit would mean that uh, it's a 50 million, of course, minus 46, that's then 4 million. Now, looking at the net profit, you remember we had uh, calculated the borrowing cost in, and it was 1,054,109.22. So first we subtract that from uh, the net profit and then there's the transaction levies, because remember when the short sellers sold the securities, they sold in the normal market at the NSC. And that transaction is uh, subject to the normal uh, transaction levies and commissions. So on the selling side, when they sold, at, uh, we take a rate of 1.8%. That's just for example, it could be less. And, uh, on the time when they buy back the securities, again, we calculate 1.8% of the 46 million. And that gives us the total of the transaction levies uh, and commissions that they have to pay. So uh, then we subtract that those from the gross profit of 4 million, which they had received. And then the net would then come to uh, 1,217,891 shillings. Then remember the collateral that they provide, the 110% uh, of the value of the shares they borrowed, that collateral earns an interest at 6%. So the total interest earned for the 90 days for the 55 million shares that they, uh, 55 million shillings that they provided as collateral adds up to 813,000 shillings. So when you add that to the profit they got from the SLB transaction, then uh, they have a total profit of two, around 2 million shillings. So that is the gain that a short seller would make over that period of just 90 days on one stock. Then uh, why is SLB important in short selling? I had uh, alluded to it earlier. When a short seller sells, uh, does a short sale, they need to cover that short position. We've just taken uh, a sample of um, short transactions that have been done over the period of January to September this year. And in these cases, because there were no uh, lend, there was no one uh, that had fronted shares 
for lending, it meant that the CDs here had to buy back the shares within the two days that they can meet the obligation. But with securities lending and borrowing, they would have been able to borrow the securities and buy them back when the price has uh, fallen appreciably. So SLB just gives you that uh, period of time to be able to recover the securities. Now we look at some samples of where the short selling opportunities uh, come from. If you look at the price of ABSA over that period from uh, January to June this year, you can see from the graph, uh, the areas where these are deep in the price. Uh, for example, on March, uh, between March 23rd and April 6th, there was a, a, a drop in price, a 6.4% drop in price, which would have been an opportunity for a short seller to make some money. We look at also equity around the same period between March 24th and April 12th. Again, there, there was a drop of 10.2%. And again, later June, there was again another drop of 3.9%, which would have been an opportunity for a short seller to have made some money. DTB, the same, there are several opportunities with uh, drops between 9.9 and 18.4%, which are opportunities again for short sellers to make money. Uh, Bamburi cement, the same between April and May a drop of around uh, 21%. Then uh, now, where are the opportunities for short selling? These are lines that we often see in the papers every now and then, where they say NSC investors wealth down 146 billion, the NSC loses 74 billion, NSC suffers biggest daily loss, we usually look at as a bad thing for the market because um, we have no way of uh, gaining from these particular opportunities. But when we look at it uh, from the short selling angle, we can see that every time we have such headings, it means that there was an opportunity to earn income through short selling because the market cap goes down because the price of some particular securities has dropped. Now, if we have uh, people in the market able to take uh, advantage of those opportunities to be able to get income, even the market prices are going down then not only be reporting that uh, investors' wealth has gone down because the uh, same opportunity lead to an increase in uh, revenue for some investors who take advantage of the, of the falling prices and earn some additional income. So meaning for the lenders on the lending side, they lent out the securities even the price goes down and the value of their portfolio goes down, they can still get some income from the lending and therefore like um, the portfolio losses or uh, totally of offset the portfolio losses so that what they're reporting as losses is much less as compared to if they had not lent out their securities. On the borrowing side, you have investors who really want to invest in the stock market, but you find at that time, since the prices are going down, they cannot buy the securities because they don't want to lose value. So they can uh, use that money as a, a collateral and borrow those securities and take advantage of the falling prices. And in that way, we'll be able to make uh, change the conversation from just market is falling, investors are losing wealth, we can change the conversation. And uh, if you remember my first read on uh, the global securities uh, lending revenues, 
it will be possible for us to also have such a there we are saying there are some revenue from the lending side even though the market was going down but still that's the end of my presentation i want to hand it over back to you thank you thank you marian thank you for that insightful presentation Thank you for that insightful presentation. I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Yes, Mar yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, I think there is a lag from where where I'm, I'm hosting this session, but thank you again. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, uh, from from uh, what I what I gather looking at the the, the presentation and what you are explaining is that. Uh, SLB and short sell. Short selling is not necessarily SLB, but SLB can help facilitate investors to engage in short selling. So, am I right uh, with making that uh, making that uh, assumption that SLB is not necessarily just for short selling purposes, but SLB will allow an investor in the Kenyan market to, or even international market, to participate in the Kenyan stock market as a short seller. Marion? Sorry, my network is fluctuating. Could you please repeat the question? I, I wanted you to confirm my, my assumption based on your presentation, where I was saying that from my understanding of your presentation and how you've explained it, a short seller, uh, a short seller can use SLB to engage in short selling as an investment strategy, but SLB is not exclusively supposed to perform short selling uh, transactions. Yes, that, that's correct, Steve. Uh, in terms of SLB supports short selling. So I think the two of them have to go together because um, when you look at uh, securities lending, for it to be able to uh, generate any revenue, there has to be a short seller on the other side. Because when you're lending shares, unless there's someone intending to short sell, then uh, there's no opportunity there. So the SLB supports short selling, but also, uh, short selling is necessary for the securities lending market to be able to to grow and uh, generate revenue thank you thank you and at this point i'd like to ask the other panelists to just uh, put on their mic so that we can go into the discussion session i had seen during marion's presentation that there were some two hands raised uh, I don't know if the, the the questions they had have been addressed during the presentation because i see the hands have been lowered uh, you could, uh, I had seen uh, Francis raising his hand. Uh, yes. So, Francis, uh, just uh, share your thoughts or question so that uh, we can we can proceed. Thank you, Francis. Francis, are you able to speak? Okay, I think I think we we'll, we can move on to the next question. Um, this this question I think would would be best served by by you, George. Oh, okay. I think Francis is about to speak. Francis. I don't know if Francis is having a challenge. Or am I the one who is not uh, being heard? Marion, George, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think uh, Francis probably has a challenge with his audio. So we can okay. probably proceed. We can proceed and then, okay, yeah. we can. All right, so there, there's a question here. Uh, and I think, George, you, you, you would best uh, advice or even or even Linus 
uh, there's a, an anonymous attendee asking, for someone seeking to short sell, what would be the recommended analysis method between fundamental or technical? Um, I'll take, it depends. I mean, do they want to be day traders? I mean, short selling is largely for day traders. So mm. if you want to be a day trader or, or a hourly trader, you can go for fundamental analysis. Or, sorry, you can go for technical analysis. Um, but fundamental analysis is typically a reserve of um, buy and hold strategies, which is uh, going long on a security. Okay. Uh, I hope the anonymous attendee has been has been addressed. I don't know if Francis is still able to speak. I think Francis can type this question. Yeah, yes. Uh, there's also another question. Uh, are there plans for margin short selling? This would go to you, Marion. Are there plans for margin short selling where one can leverage trades? This is by Rob, by Joe Bryan. Um, at the at the moment, there is no uh, margin short selling because uh, this is a strategy that has to be first of all embraced by the brokers because the brokers are the ones who would provide the margin accounts and enable their customers to be able to uh, use the margins to be able to trade. But I believe that's a conversation that is ongoing between the brokers and the exchange. So I would not be able to comment further on that. Okay, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for that uh, feedback, Marion. And even as, as we go into the panel discussions, uh, I wanted to, to get your thoughts, Marion, on uh, we are approaching a, a, an election year as a country. And for both local and international investors, this is usually a time where most people are, are very cautious about their investments. So you'll find long, the, the long-term investors are, are uh, either deciding to exit the market or to just weather the storm and see what happens, what, what, we, what will come out on the other end while the people who would have taken this opportunity to also make some money in the period are, are, uh, are left, are left to, to their own devices until probably after the election period. So would you say that short selling or securities lending and borrowing would be able to serve the participants in the capital markets, at least in the coming uh, period that we are about to experience? Um, yes, uh, I think the election period will be a very opportune time for people to be able to make some money using securities lending and borrowing and short selling. And this is because uh, from experience from the past, if you look at the, uh, the NSC20 share index over time, especially during that election period, you will always see a dip in uh, uh, the value of stocks and the market prices. And uh, this is mostly because, no, it's, it's not because the, uh, the listed companies will uh, suffer loss during that time, but um, as you're aware, our market is uh, mostly uh, foreign dominated. And by that, I mean that uh, over 60% of the transactions we see on our market are done by foreign clients as opposed to local clients. So when there's a news that there is an election that is going to come up, what they do so that they can be on the safe side, they exit the market. And because they hold big volumes, when they exit the market, the prices of the securities are likely to dip during that time when they exit. And that uh, therefore brings an opportunity for someone to be able to do a short sale and to uh, earn some revenue during that uh, election period. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks, thanks, Marion. And just for the audience, please feel free to raise your hand and put your questions on the Q and A section. We shall be uh, able to respond to you during this session, and, and if not, we can do it after the webinar session. So I'll, I'll win in another question, and probably uh, before we we go to that, uh, Linus, do you do you see uh, SLB helping you as an SLB agent to be able to engage in other investment strategies apart from short selling? Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen, and thanks uh, to, to our audience uh, this morning. 
in terms of uh, securities lending and uh, what what other investment strategies uh, that would would be available in the market top of my mind comes diversification uh you know given that there exists a negative uh correlation between say long and short positions uh securities lending gives as an opportunity to more or less express our views on the price movement of any counter at any point in time is is, is it going up you know then it's long uh if it's going down then slb gives you the opportunity to to go short so in terms of diversifying uh the investment strategies from the normal uh then it gives us that opportunity uh take example say institutional investors say pension um, you know people who, who manage pension pension funds you know securities lending will give them that opportunity to more or less uh, uh, take advantage uh you know a low risk type activity that will help them earn an income from from uh would be idle assets uh besides that uh, i would also look at uh, say uh you know return enhancement the ability to to earn an extra an extra coin for example if this is the lender uh, from from the lending fee and of course uh, uh you know, last but not least the ability to hedge uh, to use it as a tool uh, for 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 hedging to to mitigate you know uh, risks that are more more apparent when it comes to to stock markets or or when one is involved in uh, trading of financial securities Thank you, thank you, Linus. And I think that that last bit about hedging is what also Marion was talking about, where she said there are some CDS who are not able to to engage in some uh, posi uh, positions because there was no uh, lenders or there was no uh, product or uh, securities available for them to lend so that they could meet their obligations. And uh, and uh, yes, indeed, that is that uh, an an opportunity for for different participants, both lenders and borrowers, to engage in securities lending and borrowing, and even an incentive. And uh, now I'm getting also a question from an, an Onesmas Rugut, who is asking, probably Marion, for an, in, an individual who knows what he or she is doing, I think you, you had said that uh, securities lending and borrowing or short selling should be for investors or people who have an understanding of uh, the capital markets and, and the investment strategies. So he says, should he be that individual who, who knows what he or she is doing in the capital market, how can he uh, short sell and what would be the requirements uh, for him to undertake that transaction with their stockbroker? Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, for them to be able to short sell because, of course, they have to go through the broker because the broker is the one with the access to the system. So what they would need to do is they would need to provide the collateral for whatever shares that they want to borrow in order for them to be able to meet the short sale. So they would give the instruction to their broker to do their short sale on their behalf, but they have to have provided collateral. And of course, the broker has to have confirmed that those securities are actually available. There's someone who is willing to lend those securities so that uh, they can actually do the transaction simultaneously in terms of borrowing the securities and doing the short sale. So the broker is the one that will be able to assist them in that transaction. Thank you, thank you. I hope Onesmas, you've been answered. And the broker here are the SLB agents uh, in our local uh, market case, right? Marion? The, the, the stock broker would be the SLB agent, right? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, George, uh, they, 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 Marion has given us uh, the, the other side of the, of the, of the, of the, of the strategy where, where an investor would, would make money uh, in 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 a bear market, as well as the lender who would then be lending their money and and earning lending fees. But what what have you seen as some of the potential risks uh, for an investor who would be engaging in securities lending and borrowing, both at, at on the lending side as well as on the borrowing side? Maybe you can share your insights on that. Or of course, being cognizant of the different risk mitigation measures CDC has put in place. Um, okay, Steve, 
Thanks. Um, for now, it, it looks less risky because um, it's in a, it, it looks to me it's in, still in a trial stage. So a lot of the mitigation measures are being put in place, including providing collateral um, you know, to fully secure such transactions. Um, and I would, I would imagine that collateral here is purely cash uh, because you have to provide a cash cover. Uh, but obviously still, even uh, at this stage, there's still a risk of capital loss. You can get your bets wrong. You know, you can uh, you have to go short and things uh, reverse. So there's still a risk of, the, the old traditional risk of capital loss is still there. But of course, a lot of risks would come in when you now institute naked short selling um, and margin trading. And now, the, now you introduce a whole new, um, the risk area, you have interest rate risk, you have liquidity risk, and you still have the capital risk of capital loss. So, so now I think for me, it's still being, the, the rollout is still being done on a cautious basis so to minimize all the uh, major risks, but you still have the risk of capital loss. And this mainly applies to the borrower or to both, both uh, lenders and borrowers in the transaction, George? Um, it's a borrower. So for now, right now, the borrower bears all the risks. <laughs> yes, but I think it, uh, with, with high risk, then you would expect high, high returns. And based on what Marion has shown, uh, the borrower also stands to gain more consider, considerably more than, than the lender in that transaction. I think it is, it is a risk that they should be willing to, to, to tolerate, uh, in my understanding. But it's, in my not, it's not a straight line. So you can take a bet that... Uh, uh, Safaricom would do X, you know, and then it does Y. So mm. there's only the market can always surprise you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Linus, what are your thoughts on the risks? You being now an SLB agent and also doing, uh, advising your, uh, your clients as well as trading for KCB. What, would, what are the risks that you feel would, would have been or have been uh, mitigated uh, in this SLB transaction? I uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, well, well, I think as as, as an agent, uh, you know, the, the risks that come to mind, uh, uh, you know, top of my mind is usually uh, counterparty risk, uh, liquidity risk. But these are risks that I believe that uh, you know, have, having looked at uh, what what is being proposed uh, for securities lending, you know, these are risks that are you know well taken care of by 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 the, by the regulator in terms of uh, you know making sure that uh, uh, you know if 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 i'm lending if i'm lending the, the stocks that belong to my client then there is there is sufficient cover in terms of uh, you know collateral or cash cover uh, in terms of liquidity our market also uh, tends to be to be to be quite robust if you look at the you know the, the major counters or the nsc 20 so in terms of uh, liquidity uh, or, or counterparty risk, then, then, then those are, are well, well taken care of for investors who are interested in venturing into this particular space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linus. We have several questions from Rakesh, who seems to be uh, an, an investor. And I think I'll start with the, with the la uh, second last one, where he was asking uh, us, how are dividends treated in, in SLB? And uh, will they be taxed at source or how is withholding tax handled by the SLB agent. Marion, you could take this uh, from Rakesh, then I can share with you other, other questions. He's asked how, how dividends are being treated in SLB and are they taxed at source and uh, withholding tax uh, by the SLB agent? How is that handled? Okay, um, for the dividends, how it's handled is that uh, when a dividend is announced, they usually, uh, provide a book closure date and uh, of course the effective date. So what would happen is uh, there are two options. So uh, both the borrower and the lender have the opportunity to pull out of the transaction if they want the dividend to, to go the normal way to be paid by the issuer direct to the client and so on and so forth. However, if uh, none of them close the transaction before the book closure date, what happens is that the system will automatically accrue a dividend. 
as an obligation to the borrower because the borrower borrowed the securities. And in the regulations, it's very clear that the lender should not lose out because of an SLB transaction. So it will be the obligation of the borrower to pay the lender that dividend. So at the end of that SLB transaction, the obligation that needs to be paid by the borrower includes the lending fee that they're supposed to pay the lender and any dividend that has accrued during that period. So the dividend that uh, the lender will receive is according to what their uh, tax category is, are they resident, non-resident. So they will receive, uh, if they are tax exempt for it, they'll receive the whole uh, 100% of the dividend. And uh, once they receive that, that becomes as part of their income and they will report it as a part of their income uh, in, in the normal way that uh, they report for uh, the income. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. And I think you've even answered I'm the, just scrolling the other question about that profits. He had another question on the dividend. His question on dividends was on the withholding tax of that uh, dividend. And I think you've also clarified the part that should the lender want to enjoy their dividends with uh, immediately, they can then choose to terminate that contract, of course, by giving that 14-day notice or choose to let the contract stay until the end and earn it at, at, the, at the end of the, of the contract period. And also, I, I believe you've answered his question about the, how profits uh, uh, are treated uh, or profits for the lender and borrower are treated. But there's one question, can the losses be deducted against ordinary income? Losses uh, are probably on the borrowing side. Can they be deducted against ordinary income? Um, uh, it means against the income for the company. I'm not too sure about the question. In terms of your understanding of the question. Um, I'm not sure. I think we can have him share. He can share a, a further clarification on the same uh, as we deal with the other queries being raised in the Q&A section. Uh, George, I don't know if we've lost George, but um, I, wanted, I wanted you to also clarify on something. Maybe Linus will take this. Uh, from your extensive experience in the capital markets, um, stocks, stocks, uh, stocks and uh, what's it called? Stocks and bonds uh, are the main instruments traded in our market. What, why do you think this is the case? And that, uh, does that then make uh, even more reason to have a product like securities lending and borrowing? Because we seem to only be, uh, as a market, to only be keen on uh, bonds and and uh, and stocks, while there are other instruments, including even derivatives. Linus. Uh, uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, it's, 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 it's true. You've noted that uh, our market is uh, plain vanilla, you know, stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. It's, it's definitely uh, not a normal occurrence. You know, there's a reason why sometimes the market should stagnate and uh, there'll be, let's say, a low, low uptake of, 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 of new products or new products coming into the market. Uh, for example, uh, for, 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 for any product, let's say, to be able to penetrate the market, you, you know, the, the, the investors, in this case, uh, you know, depending on the position of the, of the participants, would, would require to have a basic knowledge uh, of the product in terms of their ability to make, uh, you know, prudent financial decisions. Uh, when it comes to, to our market, it's mainly been dominated by, by, by stocks and bonds. You know, having come from an era where we've had, uh, you know, quite a number of uh, uh, companies going public and listing, you know, it, it more or less provided the only investable asset uh, in our market. But that said, it also gives opportunity to now uh, start venturing into more exotic products, you know, that are more, that are derived or have, or for, or, or have been, uh, you know, we've already formed the, the, the base 
for, for exotic products, uh, uh, you know, securities lending or, or short selling being, being one of them. And of course, derivatives, you know, all these things tie around uh, to the extent that if you're in, involved in the, in, in, the, in the long positions in the traditional markets, then as we said, you can hedge uh, your risks with uh, you know, a short selling. And to a larger extent, uh, you, know, you can exercise uh, uh, some, some investment ac activities around the uh, derivatives to, to mitigate risks that uh, would also uh, be prevalent in the, in the short selling. Thank you, Linus. And, and, and for the people who are also interested in how SLB and uh, the derivatives instrument work, we, we did a webinar about uh, securities lending and borrowing and derivatives and how they, they work together. So you can also check our YouTube page uh, to see how those two products uh, coexist. Uh, if we don't, it doesn't necessarily mean that one, one means uh, uh, you can use SLB without derivatives or neither can you uh, do, do you not have to use derivatives with SLB? You can actually use both or choose either. Uh, George, it's good to, to have you back. My, my, my question for you before we went to Linus was, you are exposure in the global markets, and I believe you have, you've had a chance to also interact with the CDSC uh, SLB framework. What have you noted as the differences or similarities between what CDSC is offering in the Kenyan market with regard to SLB and how the international market carries out short selling? Thank you. George? Yeah, um, there's not much difference, actually. Uh, it's the same, same framework. It's just that uh, uh, in the global market, of course, being more advanced, they have been practiced this uh, offering for a long time. Now they've become more, um, they have more nuances on it. But I think fundamentally, this is the same, same framework that they use uh, uh, in terms of short selling. Thank you. So for, for any investor, I think they, they can uh, get that confidence that indeed the product is benchmarked against international standards. So whatever we are offering is what they would technically uh, get should they have been exposed in the international markets. The only difference is the stocks, right? Yeah, and also look forward to going naked on this, you know, in the future. We, we, yeah, uh, Marion can, can, uh, can answer that. But uh, indeed, even now, I, I, I think that there might be a misconception that you can, even now with it being in the pilot space, the, cast, the lender and borrower can still uh, engage in SLB and, and make money with all the necessary risk mitigation measures uh, put in place. Marion, you can just add to, to, to that uh, uh, thought by George, who, who, who might be carrying sentiments of other investors. Uh, yes, I think, uh, Steve, you've just uh, captured it correctly. But uh, in terms of uh, naked short sales, uh, that's the no for now. The regulations don't allow. Uh, George, there you have it. But I think even with the current uh, framework, one should be able to make money, as has been illustrated severally by the different uh, uh, parties. There's another question, I think, again, directed to you, Marion. Um, if, a, if a securities lender from Jaffet, if a securities lender can recall the securities lent, can the borrower likewise return the securities be, before the end of the term of the contract? Yes, yes. The simple answer is yes. The borrower can return the securities at any time during that duration of the contract without uh, any penalty. Yeah. Um, and uh, this this can also be taken by Linus. Uh, you, you you serve as an SLB agent uh, for for both lenders and and borrowers. There there is some concern that the CDSC has put uh, uh, that cap for the collateral a, a bit higher uh, than than would be comfortable for borrowers. What would you say? Uh, maybe you can start with you, Linus. What would you say with regard to CDSC's collateral requirement of 100% and 10% additional margin for the borrower to to acquire those shares? Thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, well, you know something that is 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 new uh, requires a uh, you know you know baby steps. So I I, I do not suppose that uh, you know the hundred percent and the ten percent uh, cover is 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 is, uh, is 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 let me say out of out of reach. Uh, as and when you know the market is active and you know it, there's always there's always room to review. Things downwards. 
uh, you know, you, 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 you're better off reducing, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, adjusting risk downwards than upwards when, when you're already in it. It's more prudent to, 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 to give proper provisions. Once the market is vibrant and active and we can actually see how, you know, the incomes, the risks involved, you know, the inherent risks involved uh, in any business, then at, at a later date, I believe uh, CBSE uh, would, 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 would not be hesitant, for example, to, to look at, you know, the risk, the risk margins, and even possibly be a little bit more ambitious uh, in terms of uh, defining risks dependent on, uh, you know, the, the, the security, the securities involved. I would want to imagine that some securities are more liquid than others, and maybe they would then uh, attract, you know, less stringent uh, uh, collateral uh, requirements. Thanks, Linus. And uh, Marion, maybe just to add to that, you could also share the rationale for us in insisting on that 100% uh, collateral requirement for securities to be lent. Yes, um, again, as I said earlier, the rationale is that we want to assure the lender that there's enough collateral to be able to buy back their securities in case the borrower defaults. So for us to give that uh, guarantee, that assurance, we have to then hold collateral that should be sufficient to buy back those shares even if the price of those shares goes up. So the 100% is to cover the price at that point. But then the price might change the same day, next day, over the next uh, several days, the price might change. So that 10% is to cover that price movement. As, and as the price goes up, the system also does a daily marking to market to ensure that the collateral is always at 110%. So if, for example, the price goes up, that means that the collateral we are holding starts to fall below 110%. And so we would request for more collateral from the borrower so that at any one point, those shares are covered at a level of over 100%. So if the borrower defaults and does not uh, return the securities, then we have sufficient collateral to be able to buy back the security from the market and return to the lender in a timely manner. And uh, just uh, to add something onto that feeling that the 110% is too much, I think uh, the, those on the borrowing side you need to look at it differently in terms of yes you are bringing in collateral worth 110 percent but immediately you borrow those shares and you sell them you receive 100 percent back because that's the value of those shares because you borrowed to to cover the short sale so you sell immediately you get your 100 percent back you can reinvest it in the market you can take it back to your fixed deposit account, you will only be required to bring it back at the end of the SLB transaction to buy back those shares. And meanwhile, the 110% that you brought in cash is deposited in a collateral account, which is a call account that is earning interest at 6%. So that means like from the same amount of money you are earning interest, from uh, the collateral deposit. Again, when you get the 100%, you can uh, either invest it or earn some additional uh, income from it, from either fixed deposit or whichever other angle. And then again, on the SLP transaction, on the, on the short sale, you are able to earn some additional revenue when the price of the security goes down. So that means from the same amount of money, you can earn uh, revenue three different ways. And I don't think there are many investments which uh, provide that much opportunity. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Marion. And thank you for clarifying on the flexibility of, uh, of, uh, of that collateral, at least with regard to the borrower who might be a bit uh, un uh, uncomfortable with providing that much collateral. Uh, George, a, a question. A question for you, with with regard to 
were you to invest uh, to invite uh, to advise a customer uh, a customer or an investor on participating in securities lending and borrowing what would be you, your main motivation for a person engaging as a lender or a person engaging as a borrower to 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 pursue such uh, slb as an investment strategy Um, I would advise portfolio managers when managing my, my my retirement portfolio to go short as a as a risk management uh, tool. For first, as a risk management, uh, you can hedge your portfolio by if you're long, then you can go short, so that you can take um, can take advantage. In, in both cases, you have an upside. So if the if the stock goes down, you you have an upside. If the stock goes up, you have an upside. So uh, I think for me, it's a portfolio hedging um, strategy. Um, and the second thing is that um, you don't have to actually buy the the actual shares, right? So from the onset, you don't have to buy the actual shares, although you're providing a uh, cash cover, but you don't have to buy the actual shares. So as, as I think as this product is refined, as you go on, then your participation, the actual purchase becomes less and less and less. Um, this, is, this is probably what you, you would classify as a, a sort of a contract for difference, where you don't have to actually uh, buy the underlying asset. So you take advantage of the difference. Um, if you look at short selling, there it is explained by Mario. Is you actually the upside is the is in the difference. Uh, without uh, when you go short, you take a difference. So that's another motivation. So the minimum, I think what I'm saying here is the the minimum initial cap requirements are not as uh, not heavy as going long. So the, those two would be the motivation. And I, I guess the product becomes more and more um, lighter. It's still very heavy, understandably, because. Um, they're just thing out, but as they become more and more light, initial capital requirements become also thin and thin and thin. This would be a big motivation. Thanks, thanks, George. Uh, Linus, any 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 other thoughts uh, for you uh, in uh, advising your clients about uh, which position to take for securities lending and borrowing, and what would be the motivation uh, for making a decision? Thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, well, well, in my case, motivation to engage in uh, this business would be twofold. One, uh, being one as an agent, and two, what would be the motivation, let's say, for for our clients? For for one, as an agent, that this would be purely for you know a diversification of of, of income uh, in terms of uh, you know new new products in the market would uh, more or less generate. Fees and commissions for for market intermediaries, so it's a welcome it's a welcome uh, a product. When it comes to to our clients, I, I think uh, securities lending, as I mentioned earlier, gives the investors the ability to express any view on any counter. So traditionally, we are constrained by upward movement. You know, we all we only go long. So in this case, then for 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 our clients, then it would give us give them the opportunity to. To go short and 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 you know take take advantage as as Marion had uh, stated uh, initially uh, with downward the uh, price price pressure you know and buy back uh, uh, you know the stocks stocks later. but more so uh, I think uh, securities lending also uh, would help uh, in in creating some sort of price discovery for illiquid illiquid securities you know I I would note a couple of uh, stocks that. Uh, trade either within the NSC to NSC 20 that are as liquid as us. So this particular one uh, would give uh, our, our customers or our clients the ability to generate some traction on, on, on some of these uh, uh, particular 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 assets. Uh, you know, on a larger scale, I think we've increased uh, investor education, uh, you know, for high net worth Sorry, sorry, Tim. I think I was dropped out again. I think technical challenges. But uh, I, I believe you, you are concluding on your point, uh, Linus, about the different uh, opportunities or the different motivations for investing in SLB for your different clients. 
And um, just before you go to, we get uh, other remarks from the, from the our panelists about uh, even different areas of improvement for this product. I would just like to engage our audience to see uh, what 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 your thoughts are with regard to this uh, webinar, and uh, we shall be sharing with you a short a short poll so that you can give you a quick feedback before we can get back to our close, closing remarks for our panelists. I believe you should be seeing uh, a poll uh on your end and you should be able to, to participate uh, um, just take a few seconds look through the questions and then share your feedback the panelists are also invited to to give their remarks <laughs> Can scroll through. There, there are four questions, so uh, you, you need to scroll also through so that you see all the questions and give your feedback. Thank you, thank you for your feedback. They're they are coming in quick and fast, and we shall be sharing with you this uh, poll uh, poll answers in after after we close it just now. Yes, Sean, we shall be sharing with you this presentation to the attendees and shall be uploading it also on our YouTube platform maybe in the next uh, coming days. We are about to close the poll, so share your final remarks or your thoughts. Thank you for your feedback. So uh, I don't know if you're able to see to see the the results see how we've uh, the different uh, answers given by our our participants can you see what i've shared i think you can you can scroll to the answers for yourself and you shall also again be sharing with you these poll results when we do the the responses. So indeed, at least we could we, we could call this a success because the uh, majority of you feel like they have an understanding of what uh, how to engage in SLB, uh, a short selling through SLB. And also, since the panel discussions uh, between Linus, George, and uh, Marion were the highlight of the event, so thank you again, for our panelists. And um, for you, for, for, for it seems our panelists, you have made a, a good case, George and Linus, for both, for both sides. So everyone seems to be interested in both sides. And I think mainly for the hedging bit, but I'm not sure what the different motivations would be. But thank you again for your feedback. And now people want to understand more about the operational framework as well as the risk, uh, risk framework of security lending and borrowing. So thank you again for your feedback. Um, we, shall be, we, shall be share, we shall be doing more webinars again uh, based on this feedback to improve uh, your understanding of this product. So just as a final remark, uh, George and, uh, and Linus, what, what areas do you think we need to improve uh, as CDSC or as a market as we try to issue this product to, to the customers or to the investors and borrowers so that they, we can get more traction? We can start with you, George. Okay, so I think one is that um... As it's being rolled out, the collateral requirements need to drop um, as, as the market becomes more and more comfortable. The collateral requirements need to be dropped. Uh, we need to introduce, I think you know, we need to start discussing with some of the lenders uh, to introduce margin trading where I can take um, a short-term trading facility to engage in, in, in short selling. And this is something that it, it's happening globally. Of course, the lenders will do their risk assessment. Um, and by lenders, I mean the commercial banks and the investment banks um, to introduce an, an margin trading on this. And also this needs to be amplified, needs to be um, amplified across to market participants and across to all the market stakeholders. People need to know that this SLB, you can actually do this. I mean, just to give an example, in 20, in 20, the market liquidity has been very tight, I mean, very thin. In 2018, um, only 10% of listed shares traded. 
In 2019, 2019, it was about 6%. Last year, it was about 5%. So you have about, I think we have about 100 billion shares listed today in the market. And only, you're talking about only 5% um, trading. I mean, that's very tight liquidity. So then this kind of initiatives like SLB can now improve trading because in different categories, you have also people who, shareholders who are, are not into trading, they, they, they buy and withhold, and this is a better proposition to increase volume and, and, and liquidity in the market. So I think this is very key and it needs to be improved uh, over and over and over time. Thank you, George. Uh, Linus, your remarks as, as we end. Uh, areas of improvement for this uh, product. All right, Th thanks, Stephen. I think uh, from where I sit, uh, you know, if there's any improvements that, that are to be made, they should all be, you know, geared towards uh, increasing, you know, efficiency, especially, let's say, on matters of uh, turnaround times. Uh, we usually say that longer processes uh, more often lead to decay of opportunities. So I, I believe that, as you know, as we, we, we look forward to this particular product, then CBSC will be looking at uh, uh, you know, working on those processes uh, to, to literally give uh, investors, uh, you know, an international standard experience when it comes to investments in the securities lending. But more reason, you know, like, no, no, more, more importantly, I think would be to, to look at areas of uh, reporting and information access, uh, you know, some, being something new in the market. I think uh, a, lot, a lot needs to be done in terms of how much more information is is, is disseminated to, to investors and participants. And more or less, let's say CBSC to come up with, you know, develop, developing more or less a dashboard where, you know, to, to act as a reporting tool where matters securities lending uh, or activities are reported either on a daily, monthly, you know, you know more you know, greater periodicity uh, so that, uh, you know, product information, uh, matters collateralization, you know, cost, cost of finance, for all the stakeholders involved in this particular business to be able to be enlightened and, and, and enlightened at a faster, faster pace uh, to be able to make uh, uh, financial decisions more, more quickly. Thanks. Thanks, Linus, and, th and thanks, George, for your feedback. Uh, I, I think we uh, might have dropped Marion, but uh, not to worry, she, she, she is uh, with us. Uh, thank you again for your uh, time uh, to the panelists, uh, George, Linus, and Marion, for your time and for your expertise in this discussion. We'd like to also thank you, our uh, audience, for being patient with us. It's, we've taken at least one hour and 35 minutes. So thank you again for being patient and staying with us till the end. And we, we promise to share with you this presentation as well as this recording once, we, once uh, they are available for sharing. So thank you again. And I uh, hope you have a good evening and see you in the next uh, SLB webinar session. Remember to check our YouTube page and our website for more information about securities lending and borrowing. Thank you and good day. Good day. Thank you.